Thank you, Keith, for this very nice introduction and also uh, a very warm welcome from my side regarding uh, today's audience. Um, I mean, Keith already mentioned what is uh, the main content of my presentation. Um, however, uh, you see my quite lengthy title, but I think it also describes it quite well. Because what I'm actually uh, looking into is using various different data sources, including Earth observation, observation techniques, which is not surprising since I work for the German Aerospace Center, but also trying to explore novel data sources, for instance, street level imagery from, from Google Street View or VGI information, uh, and analyze that kind of data, mainly based on techniques from the field of artificial intelligence in order to enable or substantially support natural hazard risk assessment and also looking at um, situations when uh, yeah, a disaster happened um, and so uh, also trying to having techniques in place to quantify the impact of such disasters. I mean, is that topic relevant? and eventually also relevant in the future. And uh, unfortunately, I think absolutely. Uh, just when looking, for instance, at the last global assessment report on disaster risk reduction, I just uh, extracted some prominent statements and those included, for instance, risk creation is outstripping risk reduction. Um, and also uh, on a, uh, from a monetary perspective, uh, you find uh, conclusions like disasters and economic losses are actually increasing. So despite all the efforts, um, the global risk seems to further increase. And therefore, I think we are really working on a very uh, relevant topic, especially the next uh, decades, uh, trying to mitigate those perils. Uh, to provide some further context, uh, I compiled um, some statistical data from the Munich reinsurance company. Um, they have quite uh, some good um, uh, numbers regarding um, past impacts of natural hazards. So what you actually see here is um, uh, the estimated monetary loss induced by natural hazards since the 1980s until today uh, in US dollars. And when you draw a trend line, you can clearly identify uh, an increasing, increasing trend regarding the monetary loss. And I think that can be mainly, mainly linked to two kind of driving factors. One is also that the number of damaging events increased. Um, that can also be, for instance, linked to natural hazards that are induced and exaggerated by climate change. So we simply see okay, that those numbers uh, increased. And the second one, I think, is related to the transformation of the human habitats. Um, I mean, brought down a bit, uh, maybe you know that statement, for instance, re related to earthquakes. So earthquakes do not kill people, but collapsing buildings do. So it's always the interaction with human settlements that really causes those big disasters. And when having a look um, how human settlements evolved in many um, nat natural hazard prone areas uh, over the world, we find examples like this. So on the left hand side, we see the settlement area in red from the coastal city Valparaíso in Chile. Um, there are many perils, including earthquakes, uh, can also trigger a tsunami, then it's very steep. So you eventually have landslides. There are frequently fire events uh, at the edges of the city. So many different natural hazards, actually. And on the right hand side, we see Istanbul in Turkey. Um, maybe I don't have to explain too much, but uh, we definitely have a, a huge uh, seismic threat. And this is simply the settlement area in the year 1975 monitored with Earth observation data. And when we do the same for the year 1990, we already see a huge increase. And that trend continues until nowadays. And that simply puts much more people, um, uh, or you, we simply have much more exposure nowadays as we had in the past. <clears throat> 
So, um, yeah, one of the main questions I'm dealing with or where I want to try to contribute is how can risk be quantified before an actual event? Um, I just use that quite uh, a common working def definition regarding risk. So that is expressed as a function of the hazard, the exposure and the vulnerability. Um, in my case, I really basically uh, consider um, the physical aspects of risk, uh, also because the measurement techniques I'm using, yeah, so measurement from Earth observation satellites, they simply measure or describe, for instance, the built environment in terms of its physical properties. So uh, I'm not really, um, how to say, following very complex risk uh, concepts um, that try to, for instance, create a very holistic point of view, where also, for instance, socioeconomic or political aspects are also uh, encoded into a final risk uh, assessment. However, I truly really try to kind of um, enhance the baseline. So trying to um, assess the physical risk. However, that can be also um, a very vulnerable information layer for more complex analysis. So in my case, and when, when we're looking, for instance, at uh, earthquake hazards, um, uh, we need to compile or describe uh, information about the, uh, the earthquake hazard, for instance, uh, expressed by a peak ground acceleration model. Then we need to compile exposure data. I mean, that frequently comprises information about the exposed population, but also really the properties of the built environment, mainly expressed by specific building types or collecting the building inventory and then um, assigning specific building types, because those building types um, uh, actually uh, show a very specific behavior under seismic load. So it is then possible to map the, uh, based on the on a given intensity of an earthquake, to um, transfer that to a specific damage grade for different building types. So therefore that is a very um, relevant information that we need to compile. And um, it is still actually one of the costliest components in risk models, actually, yeah, to compile the exposure data. And when you think about the dynamics of many um, urban systems nowadays, yeah, when you just, for instance, recall how fast cities like Istanbul grew and changed over the last four decades, I think it's really a big challenge to keep track and always having, for instance, a proper exposure model in place. So that is one of the main uh, um, uh, foci of my um, talk today, how Earth observation techniques and other data sets can uh, support the compilation of exposure data for risk models. And yeah, when you have a look at such a built environment, I think it always uh, it, it becomes clear that it's really a big challenge to compile such, a, uh, such data um, economically or cost efficient. Um, and also having kind of a monitoring capability over time. Um, so therefore, I was following two um, approaches um, to compile such exposure data. One is more of a top-down approach. So I disaggregate existing exposure information based on Earth observation techniques. So to really enhance the spatial resolution properties of such an existing exposure model. And the second one is a, a bottom up approach. So there the idea is to really collect new exposure information basically in situ with remote sensing techniques. And I start with the top down approach. Um, it is kind of motivated that nowadays, um, of course, there were many projects in place uh, and many initiatives that already compiled very valuable exposure information. Uh, what you actually see here is the city of Santiago in Chile, also prone to um, big earthquake events, for, for instance. And in the past, um, there were projects, uh, this one is called uh, SARA, uh, also related to CHEM, to the global earthquake models, that compiled exposure information, for instance, regarding uh, the specific distribution of building types uh, and also assigning the corresponding fragility functions based on statistical data for um, yeah, dedicated spatial entities, 
uh, and you see that here, those are the spatial entities that they used. Uh, I think they were kind of constrained based on the statistical data that they uh, kind of um, uh, could use for their uh, analysis and research. Uh, it's called uh, Comunas. Yeah, maybe if you uh, also worked in that area, you are eventually uh, familiar with that spatial concept. However, what you already also see is that it still features a substantial level of aggregation because, um, I mean, it's kind of semi-transparent. So you see that it's the, the built environment is still quite heterogeneous within such a comuna. Okay, and so the only information that you really have is this um, uh, distribution on that level. So uh, one way was to say, okay, that is very valuable information. However, we want to really enhance the spatial resolution in order to be also able to encode, for instance, very small scale hazard effects. Uh, uh, and that would not be possible with such an uh, aggregated exposure model. And we used uh, two Earth observation missions that deliver relevant information to do this. And um, that is also, and those missions are also producing data on a global scale. One is the so-called Tandem X mission that produces a global digital surface model with 12 meter resolution. And that already allows, based on uh, specific uh, techniques that we have developed, to extract, for instance, the height properties of the built environment not really on building level, I would, uh, I would say on a kind of a neighborhood level, but this is how it looks like for a big city. So you have those uh, blocks here that are indicated and then the, the uh, corresponding height information. And additionally, we also integrated multispectral imagery from Sentinel-2, which is also globally available and freely accessible. And we basically use that information to further refine our description of the intra-urban land cover. So we use the data to, for instance, prune intra-urban vegetation areas so that we really um, uh, end up with the elevated built up areas indicated in red. And those are actually the areas that are really interesting for us because those are the buildings. And uh, this is actually um, um, the information that we use to disaggregate the existing exposure information. Uh, and we used it to basically compute two uh, variables, and that is the build up height and the build up density. Um, this is actually what you see here yeah, for the big metropolitan area of Santiago de Chile, also including this coastal city Valparaiso that I also mentioned at the very beginning, that is also very, very dynamic. And then we um, developed uh, a disaggregation approach um, where the main idea, I don't want to go that much into detail, but the main idea is that we have the information on communal level regarding the li living area per building type. And those building types uh, that, that are, for instance, mason buildings uh, or brick buildings uh, or, or different types, they also have a very specific height class. Yeah, so the, the taxonomy of those building categorization comprises, for instance, um, yeah, uh, uh, for instance, concrete reinforced buildings with one to two floors or steel buildings with four to eight floors. Okay, and so those colors indicate actually the actual height class, yeah, the bluish, the yellowish and the reddish one. And we use our continuous height measurements to um, and, and we kind of uh, recategorize uh, our height measurements based on that distribution so that we have uh, that we reproduce the relative height uh, distribution according to those classes spatially. Yeah, this is then how it looks here. And so we, then we know that all of the uh, different buildings of the different building types of a specific height class, yeah, maybe height class one, they need to end up in those areas that are indicated in blue here. And the same goes for the different height classes. And the density that we also derive from the uh, Earth observation data is used as a further weighting factor to distribute the uh, living uh, area per building type. And what you uh, get when you uh, follow such a procedure is um, uh, already uh, shown here. So what you simply see is one specific building type. It's reinforced concrete buildings, one to three floors. Um, the color indicates simply the number 
And this is the existing exposure model um, that we started working with. And you simply see a uniform distribution within that spatial entity of Comuna. On the right hand side, you see actually a, a reference mapping regarding that specific type. And you already see, okay, within those Comunas, there are often like substantial gradients and really hot spots uh, of the buildings that are not captured in this existing model. However, when we actually apply our method, and when we disaggregate uh, the existing uh, information here based on the height and the density and based on the workflow I just described, then we get this result, which is much closer to the actual reference and also captures, for instance, really those intra um, uh, um, yeah, gradients regarding the spatial distribution of, this, of a specific building type here. And we did this with all the existing types that we can find in Santiago de Chile. Um, I think it's 18 overall. That is always the starting point. I mean, you see that, for instance, very uh, specific building types, they are very scarce. Yeah, you only have that here, for instance, in the south area. Others are very dominant and uh, yeah, you can find them basically all over the city. And when we apply our technique, yeah, we can map out those building types uh, in much greater spatial detail. In order to get uh, to an actual yeah, risk model, we then also compiled um, uh, hazard uh, information or hazard models and also aligned fragility functions um, to our different building types. Um, I think that is shown here. So we, for instance, computed based on probabilistic seismic hazard assessment different kind of scenarios. So for instance, uh, how uh, the corresponding um, PJA would look like for quite a likely event with a um, probability of occurrence of 50% within the next 50 years. And then yeah, we went simply down uh, to a more or very extreme event with only a 10% probability within the next almost 500 years. However, the PJA would also be correspondingly very high. And as I said, um, based on those types, we can also then assign fragility functions which provide the capability to map the intensity to a specific um, damage class. And you see also how they really vary for different building types. And this is uh, already then the result if we apply that um, pipeline of techniques. So here um, you see for this quite likely scenario, um, the corresponding spatial distribution of damage um, divided according to four different damage classes. So the first one that is also then very frequent uh, is slight building damage. Then we have medium damage, heavy damage and completely destroyed. And then we can simply compute for all the different scenarios the corresponding spatial maps that allow us to really anticipate, OK, what would happen on a building related damage level based on those events. And for instance, for Chile and also for Santiago, there can also be found some, uh, yeah, let's say it's basically empirically collected uh, uh, numbers, how those damage grades and the corresponding number of damaged buildings uh, really translate also into um, human injuries and losses. Yeah, so we also uh, then, for instance, disaggregated the population accordingly, and then we can also compute for those different scenarios. Now we already at the very strong one, the number of um, slightly injured people um, up to really the number of deadly injured people. And I think that really uh, gives uh, quite a, a comprehensive picture of what can be anticipated <coughs> before such an event and how is the, the risk situation and how Earth observation data sets and corresponding techniques could really enhance the spatial distribution or the spatial resolution here. So for instance, we are also working uh, for other big metropolitan areas in South America, so not only Santiago, but also for instance, Lima and in Peru, in Quito and Ecuador, based on those uh, Earth observation based data sets that actually exist on a global scale also. OK, so that was my top down approach. However, in parallel, we were also working on techniques uh, that allow um, 
a really a collection of exposure information in C2, which is also very relevant if such a model that we uh, had, for instance, for Santiago, and which was compiled based on a previous project, are not really uh, in place or already I mean, maybe like really outdated. Yeah? So if the model is maybe 15, 20 years old, and we really have a strong settlement dynamic. Um, so then maybe such a um, uh, input data is not really um, uh, feasible anymore. And here we were looking actually also for novel data sources that could complement the Earth observation data that kind of, how to say, um, yeah, uh, a bit sloppy speaking, uh, provides uh, the, the top view yeah, and just uh, looking uh, from, from the top uh, on the built environment. So we identified Google Street View as quite a complementary data source um, to also sense the built environment. Um, and here you see such a car. Uh, I think there are also now uh, other um, similar initiatives in place. I mean, Microsoft is doing something like that. We have also we were also working with Mapillary, that is an open source community uh, where people can actually upload their smartphone uh, pictures on street level. Um, um, yeah, on street level. So uh, nowadays we can also really find a big uh, collection of potential data. And now the, the idea is actually to also characterize the buildings according, for instance, to their seismic building structural type. Yeah, that is simply the term um, that allows then also the mapping uh, according to damage, for instance, for earthquakes um, based on such data. So we have actually developed a workflow for a structured harvesting of the Google Street View imagery. So here you see simply um, uh, how the system captures images. So you can really download uh, the geolocation of the different images uh, with quite a, a dense sampling. And just to give you an impression how the imagery looks like, um, some examples. And you already see, okay, that um, yeah, various different building types are already simply contained in that imagery. And then we have developed a, a workflow that foresees, for instance, first to filter the whole pool of Street View images because um, I, I think you can see it here. So it's of course not only facade. Uh, information that is compiled, but yeah, okay, everything is collected. So also very uh, a lot of non-relevant information for us. For instance, here you have a, a palm tree, or you see simply some backyards or other images that are not really relevant. However, based on a, a pre-trained deep learning network, we filtered out um, only the facade imagery, and the next step was then to um, uh, compile a training data set um, for the different building classes that exist. And hereby we also really uh, um, uh, developed a, a dedicated labeling scheme. So that really works with, okay, what kind of features that are visually contained in the imagery uh, allow me to make a decision to which specific building type it really belongs. And that was then uh, finally fed into a deep learning um, uh, network in order to uh, discriminate, I think it was 14 different building types uh, with the main target variable was that seismic building structure type, but we also tried to map out the material load resisting system uh, and for instance, the height. And overall, we got quite um, encouraging accuracies, uh, definitely um, above 80% for the best models, almost 85%. And this is actually how um, that approach provides then information uh, spatially. Um, so here you see actually one specific building type. Yeah, here you see also the, the images uh, as an example and how that building type is spatially distributed over the city of Santiago. And of course, we find different types here. This is uh, kind of historical buildings that can be found mainly here in the main area and other more uh, generic types that you can really find all over the place, basically. But you see that those different types, they really have a quite distinctive pa pattern quite frequently. And based on this approach, we can really um, 
provide that information with a very high degree of automatization. <coughs> okay, um, what we're currently doing is actually two things. Uh, the first one, and that work is actually also finished now, is that we try to extend our description. Um, so we are not looking into only mapping out one specific target variable, so directly going for an earthquake specific building type. Yeah, so that is also quite it requires also um, a lot of prior knowledge, uh, actually. But we were also following the idea, I think that was proposed within GEM also to have a kind of faceted taxonomy and that we have basically a very exhaustive description of the built environment. And that would, for instance, also uh, allow to map um, um, those vari variables into fragility functions or vulnerability functions for multiple hazards. And therefore, the idea is to simply provide a very exhaustive characterization of a building according to also, for instance, roof type, occupancy, the spatial context, and so forth. And from a methodological level, that opens up a very interesting pathway um, that is called multitask learning. And uh, it's maybe a quite a complex scheme how the model looks like, but the basic idea is, okay, we actually want to estimate multiple target variables simultaneously. Yeah, okay, we have here multiple target variables that we want to estimate and those variables they feature an interdependency uh, i think it's quite intuitive so for instance if you want to really build a, for instance, a very high building yeah you need specific materials yeah so you will very unlikely find maybe a wooden construction with i don't know 20 floors and so there are multiple of those interdependencies regarding um, the description of our built environment. And we designed a very specific deep learning model that is able to exploit those interdependencies in order to make a better prediction. And what we could show here, I mean, the paper is still under review, is that we, for instance, can, um, based on such a multitask procedure, add around up to more than 7% uh, inaccuracy, which I think is quite remarkable when classifying, uh, for instance, a set of different variables from the imagery. And this is also what you get then. You So you see the spatial distribution of different variables in the middle. Again, those different building types that, are, that we have basically seen already, uh, just now with a better model predicted. But here you also have the mat material of the main load resisting system, the height, um, we had three different roof shapes, for instance, and here the spatial context was expressed by um, characterizing the block position. And that is really then also meant to work towards uh, multi-hazard exposure data, so having really an exhaustive description that is relevant for multiple hazards. Just to really bring into mind uh, what the, uh, the, the motivation is, to automatically map um, those types, for instance, in C2, is that based then also with the connecting it to remote sensing imagery, we can really also make um, a damage or pre-event damage assessment for a, for a, a city um, spatially continuously and also with a high resolution. So for instance, if we have different types mapped out and properly geolocated, then we can also really use that as a training data in combination with, for instance, that Earth observation based very high resolution imagery here. So we can identify that as training data, learn a statistical model, and then we have a full inventorization and also categorization of the building inventory. And in combination with those fragility functions that you have seen um, uh, already, then we can, for instance, map out based on a specified uh, potential mm -hmm. earthquake event how the damage would look like here you see those hot spots and possibly also cold spots and that can be redone then uh, with great spatial detail and uh, continuously for a city so in the past we were actually working on on multiple problems in that domain we for instance developed uh, novel algorithms for instance from the field of active learning active learning for instance tries to really compile the training data that you normally need 
for learning such a statistical model in a very efficient way. There, for instance, it works like that, that you've um, uh, learn an initial model with very little prior knowledge, and then you look at, actually at the most uncertain unlabeled samples, yeah, because those are the very interesting ones, and you would label them uh, in a prioritized way, and that allows you to go to to establish a, a robust model um, with uh, yeah, very efficiently, so to say. And as I said, we were working on multi output models or multi task models that actually try to um, optimize um, the solution with respect to multiple target variables. We were working on domain adaptation problems that means, OK, when we have, for instance, learned such a model for interpreting, for instance, the uh, street view imagery for a certain city, how can we transfer it to another city? And that is far from trivial. Because, for instance, um, uh, in the in the other city, you maybe have new building classes. You maybe have the same classes. However, their physical appearance is slightly different. So you have multiple shifts. And so we're working, for instance, on mechanisms, how um, we can use an existing model. And then also, for instance, identify in a new city, OK, that kind of building type that create such a new and unique pattern that must be a building type that uh, was not included in our model before. Okay, and further, yeah, we used some deep learning techniques or developed also some new architectures that can really provide good prediction, but it's really required to have a lot of learning and um, a prior knowledge. And that really brings me also to uh, uh, quite a recent work where we actually looked at the situation, okay, can we also obtain a good model prediction when we have only very few prior knowledge? <coughs> I will I also show an application where that uh, really became relevant. Uh, however, just some kind of theoretical considerations. Um, we were actually were building uh, upon a very uh, famous algorithm that is called support vector machines. Uh, and here you see actually um, the main idea of that algorithm, um, when you have the situation that you want to learn a model from um, prior knowledge that is indicated here with the red and blue dots, and now you actually want to have yeah, a, a classification model that allows to discriminate those two classes. Those two classes can be, I don't know, building types or, for instance, damage-related uh, for instance, very severe and very low damage related to uh, a natural hazard event can be anything. And the idea is actually to uh, establish a model that discriminates those two classes with the um, maximum margin possible. Okay, so because you have basically infinite number of possibilities how you can actually discriminate those classes. However, use the, uh, the, the function that discriminates those those two classes with uh, the largest margin possible. And for instance, the second term here then says, OK, it is also OK if we have some errors, meaning some training data on the false side of that margin in order to avoid overfitting. So that is the basic idea. Uh, however, what is also a very specific property of the algorithm that you already see here is that only few samples actually contribute to finding the model. Yeah, so for instance, you can uh, eliminate this one and that one and that one and that one from the model and it will not make a difference. So the idea is that we followed, we learn such a model from very few uh, training samples and very few data. So we learn such a model and then we extract those samples that um, contribute to the finding of the model. And then we look into the actual image domain. Okay, which samples? Okay, well, yeah, which samples are those that really contribute to finding such a model? And um, the object maybe look like this. So maybe it's uh, also when we think about land cover information, for instance, it could be here uh, a tree or vegetation object. And then the idea is that we per per tab um, that object in terms of its of its representation to create so-called virtual samples 
and trying to make that classification model invariant. Yeah, so we um, yeah we simply it's also kind of a, a, a tailored data augmentation that you maybe have uh, also used yourself in the context of deep learning models. Yeah, where for instance that you crop the image and you flip it and stuff, and that is a very tailored procedure to do something related, and then you induce those virtual samples here into your model without in actually encoding further real prior knowledge. However, that could already lead to a situation that you can learn a new model with better accuracy. However, it's also a bit of a risky strategy uh, because you can also eventually uh, com um, uh, compile or induce divergence in your model. Therefore, we, for instance, designed a further criteria that those virtual samples, they must be somehow similar to the existing actual prior knowledge that is already in, into the model. And we did this based on two criteria. For instance, those virtual samples, they must be in a specific search radius of their corresponding sample. And the second one is that also um, those new virtual samples must be within a specific uh, margin distance here relating to the previous model so that we can really have a kind of a safe learning procedure and that we do not induce divergence in our models based on uh, on that procedure and then we find eventually a new solution and we could show um, that we get higher accuracies um, based on the same actual prior knowledge and there was actually also uh, 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 a good uh, application field for such a technique. Um, and uh, that relates to the question, OK, how is the situation after an event? I mean, so far I was mainly talking about, OK, risk models that allow to anticipate what happens before such an event. However, of course, it's also very, very relevant to have directly information after a big disaster strikes. And Earth observation is, I think, maybe one of the most prominent techniques to deliver data, actual data, and not a kind of a model prediction, but actual data based on observation uh, after a big disaster in, in the time frame of hours or few days. And I also have an example that it, uh, the data we were working with uh, was uh, related to the um, tsunami event uh, from 2011 in Japan. <coughs> so um, our kind of situation where we started working with looked like this. OK, we have observation from Earth observation. Here you see um, radar acquisitions before the actual event and after the event. You already see uh, how many areas here in the in the in this coastline are inundated. And what is actually also very interesting is that nowadays, for instance, and for instance, for the whole eastern Japanese coast, that is the case, you also have a hazard intensity model, not a risk model, but a hazard intensity model. And that looks like this. OK, um, so you have a, a model um, that describes the uh, inundated area. And that um, how to say this situation regarding uh, uh, available information um, yeah, was a motivation that we said, OK, uh, now we want to automatically learn a model that allows to at least distinguish undamaged buildings and destroyed buildings, but without any labeling procedure and without compiling the actual training data for those statistical algorithms um, uh, by, for instance, a group of people, by an annotator, but, but do this really automatically. So we also built upon this support vector machines framework that I just presented. And then we said, OK, based also on that hazard intensity model, the tsunami model, um, that can directly be accessed always and therefore also like minutes after such an event, we need, uh, we, uh, we, we know, OK, uh, based in those low hazard intensity areas, there must be primarily undamaged buildings. And for that areas with a high hazard intensity, okay, we eventually have both um, undamaged and also yeah, then destroyed buildings. And then we simply uh, started to learn such an algorithm iteratively, starting with the very extremes 
that were kind of triggered by that hazard model uh, and to make that distinct distinction uh, regarding bidding damage and we could also obtain an accuracy um, above 85 percent so we didn't really have to provide label data here but we simply um, started to automatically uh, label samples as undamaged or damaged um, under consideration of an hazard intensity model. Okay, and finally, um, it's of course also very interesting how future risk situations can be anticipated. Also thinking that built environments are often very dynamic and for instance, if we have a model for the uh, today, uh, today's risk, maybe that uh, will not provide a, a proper uh, view anymore in maybe a 10 years time frame. And I think this is also where Paratus is uh, strongly contributing um, to have a better scientific understanding uh, how that question can be uh, approached and what kind of methods um, uh, are really useful to make uh, an assessment about future risks. And the, the main motivation uh, is also related to, I would say, kind of two more or less novel aspects. Um, and the one is that nowadays, uh, and based on, for instance, uh, continuous satellite missions, we now have a really exhaustive time series data that goes back in time. And that also really provides very frequent observations of, for instance, built environments or here the land use, land cover. I mean, what you actually see is uh, land use, land cover data from it's an area in China uh, starting in, in the year 1995, 2000, and then until the year 2020. Also here you see again how dynamic that area actually is. Uh, here there was also a very specific focus on informal built up areas and formal built up areas because also the informal ones are very prone to um, uh, flooding in, in that uh, case. So that was the motivation to map that out. And what you actually already see uh, based on that time series here, that change is really not happening randomly. Yeah, so you can already identify, I would say, a very constrained growth patterns of both formal and informal areas. So there is definitely a characteristic, uh, we always call it change trajectory that happens over time here. And based on uh, yeah, modern um, data analysis techniques such as um, yeah, AI or machine learning, it is possible to use such time series data also as an input to automatically encode those change trajectories that can be uh, already seen here in the time series data in a model in order to make a robust prediction about a future state. And I mean, this is actually what we do um, mainly in Paratus. Um, uh, however, um, I just show you uh, um, an example from a different test case. And what we did actually is, and what is also interesting nowadays that we have a lot of time series data uh, that already contains really relevant thematic information that we can use for risk assessment. Uh, I mean, one of uh, uh, one target variable that is very important is, for instance, the population. And there is, for instance, uh, gr multi temporal gridded population data available, for instance, from WorldPOP with a sp spatial resolution of 100 times 100 meters going back to the year 2000 and having uh, a yearly update. So you already have very relevant uh, information at hand that you can use to uh, anticipate uh, the corresponding target variables uh, for a future state. So we developed a workflow that harvests that, in that case, multi-temporal gridded population data. Then a set of driving factors is computed or independent variables that are actually the drivers of those change trajectories related, for instance, to the topography or specific um, uh, socioeconomic variables. So we have a set of driving factors, and this is the basic information that we feed into our change model. Here we were working with long short-term memory-based models that are really uh, able to capture 
the changes over the whole uh, time spectrum. And the res result is actually the forecasted population for a specific time step. I think here we went or we predicted uh, up to the year 2030. And that information can already then combine, for instance, with hazard models. We did it based on earthquake and tsunami models to see this is not really um, uh, on a risk level, but on an exposure level to see how many people will be exposed with respect to earthquakes and with respect to tsunamis in the future. And the result looks like this. Um, that is Lima in Peru. Uh, and just to explain how that uh, figure can be read is that um, those um, bars here, um, the, the gray um, part of such a bar corresponds to the current population, or that's the year 2020. And what is actually on top, or maybe what is actually uh, perforated here, is the increase or eventually also decrease here of the population. And the color indicates the hazard intensity. So on the left-hand side, you see the earthquake. On the right-hand side, you see the tsunami. And the earthquake is um, characterized here by peak ground acceleration. And so the dark color, the dark red here, indicates yeah, strong um, peak ground acceleration. And for the tsunami, it's basically the same. The darker, the higher the maximum flow depth. And that indicates that for the year 2035, this is actually um, yeah, what you see, there are many new areas with a very substantial increase of population. And those areas also are located in really tsunami prone areas, especially here on the northwestern part of Lima, and also for areas that eventually will face um, very high peak ground acceleration in the future. So that can already give a, a, I think, very good indication about future risks. And what we, for instance, want to do in Paratus is that we really compute a set of target variable that goes here beyond the population, but also uh, indicating, for instance, uh, natural hazard risk related building types so that we can really uh, have uh, a really comprehensive view on the actual risk situation in the future and not just expose people. Okay, that was basically um, the main content of my presentation. Just a very general little outlook um, how uh, that field might on a meta level uh, eventually evolve. Um, I think the situation that we face will definitely include an amplification of certain natural hazards, likely those that are related to climate change. And at the same time, we can still assume uh, a population growth and also urbanization um, in many parts of the world. And that will definitely, yeah, by definition, increase the exposure. Uh, secondly, um, I think that is a, a very, uh, maybe that is, uh, uh, how to say, a, a conflict that exists everywhere, but I think here it's also very relevant, is that um, on the one hand side, um, the model complexity increases. Uh, I mean, also when we look at Paratus, so we are not actually looking into um, uh, isolated ha uh, hazard events. Yeah, so we are already, already looking into multi-risk situations, into cascades, yeah, and, and how also um, those effects then propagate. So the models definitely become more complex in order to actually also deal with the real world complexity of natural hazard risk situations. At the same time, also when recalling how dynamic built environments are today, um, we also have to establish some kind of a monitoring capacity. So that when we create such a, a risk assessment yeah, for a city or maybe for a country, we actually have to be aware, okay, we have to do this in one, two, five, ten years again. So the data also needs to have, uh, for instance, a quite a high availability over time yeah, and must be quite generic. So otherwise, um, yeah, we have a big conflict and I think it would, will be really hard to um, to have really a, a proper model in place all the time. So having a, a kind of a, a good trade-off regarding the model complexity and also the monitoring capacity 
I think that will be really um, a quite a challenge and I think we should really kind of think about how to do that. And finally, um, of course, I think it's always um, relevant to create and keep awareness about ex existing risks for the um, actual people um, in order to establish long-term anti-fragile societies. So I think that is kind of a communication process that always needs to be integrated in our, yeah, for instance, risk assessment uh, efforts and must not be forgotten.